Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming, and um, welcome to the data debate on inequality in data. Um, th if this is your first data debate, um, then thank you very much for coming. Um, and this is um, an event series, which is a collaboration between the British Library um, and the Alan Turing Institute um, to explore the issues and challenges um, that society faces around um, data science and artificial intelligence. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick bit of information um, and run through some housekeeping. Um, there is no fire alarm due, so if it does go off, then it's genuine, so please follow the signs. Um, we've got a hashtag, which we'd love for you to tweet about the discussion that happens this evening, um, and that will appear on the next slide. Um, and I also just wanted to, um, just before we kick off with this event, just let you know that we've got another one coming up um, on the 14th of September, um, looking at cyber security um, and kind of looking at the question of whether artificial intelligence is the new defence. So that should be quite an interesting debate. So please do take a look at that um, on the British Library website. Um, and uh, lastly, on housekeeping, um, the event is going to be filmed this evening. So if you didn't want to be filmed or photographed, then please do let a, a member of staff know. Um, and if you ask a question in the Q&A, uh, then please just say you don't, watch, you don't wish to be filmed. And we'll make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Tamandra Harkness, who is going to be the moderator and the chair for this evening's discussion. Um, Tamandra is the author of the excellent read, Big Data Does Size Matter? And she's got um, a show coming up on Radio 4, um, very appropriately titled um, How to Disagree. And that will be um, out in mid-August. Um, so I'll hand over to Tramandra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, I, I return regularly to chair these data debates, which is great fun for me, but also I think really important that the role of data and AI in society is something that's for wider debate, not just by tech companies and policymakers behind closed doors. So it's lovely to discover the 100 or so people in London who either are more interested in inequality than football <laughs> or know that both England and Belgium are trying to lose and therefore it won't be a good match. Uh, however, in tribute, I have brought my, uh, my popular red and yellow cards, which I shall not hesitate to use on the speakers and indeed on the audience when we come out to you. Uh, in case you haven't seen these before, basically when, when the speaker has a, a minute to go, they get a yellow card and, uh, and when they really their time is up, and they should wind up now, please. They get a red card. They don't actually get sent off. Even if they get a red card, they are allowed to come back for the next debate. <laughs> um, we discourage diving, obviously. Uh, so the way this will work, uh, as you probably guess, is nothing particularly innovative about this. We have a wonderful panel of speakers. We have given them a ridiculously short amount of time in which to introduce their thinking on the subject of data and inequality. That's because we really want to make it a debate. So we're going to ask them to keep their remarks to seven minutes or less. And then when they have all given their short introductions, I will try and abuse my chair's privilege to monopolize them for a few minutes with a little bit of discussion up here. But then I will come out. We've got until um, around quarter to eight. So we've got plenty of time. So we'll come out and we want to hear what you have to say. What I will do is take probably around three points at a time don't feel you have to pretend it's a question. We don't, we don't play those games here. You, you can have opinions, that's fine. Uh, so I'll take about three points at a time. We have roving microphones. Uh, if, if you don't want to be filmed, say I don't want to be filmed, or disguise your voice, or pass your question to the person next to you. <laughs> we, we don't mind at all. Uh, and then, obviously, we will keep coming back to the panel to get their responses and thoughts. That's all how it'll work. Right, let me introduce the five speakers. I'll introduce them in the order in which they're going to give their introductions. So first of all, we have Dr. Sandra Wachter. I hope I'm seeing your name. Yeah, right. really good. You were checking the <laughs> slides when I was there. Dr. Sandra Wachter, uh, who's a lawyer, a fellow here at the Alan Turing Institute, and a research fellow in data ethics, AI, robotics, and internet regulation cybersecurity at the Oxford Internet Institute. Her research focuses on the legal and ethical implications of big data, AI and robotics, as well as the ethical design of algorithms, predictive policing and human rights online. So we're going to hear from Dr. Wachter first. Then we're going to hear from Catherine Mayer, who is a writer, activist, speaker, consultant, the co-founder and president of the Women's Equality Party. Her latest book is Attack of the 50-Foot Women, How Gender Equality Can Save the World, uh, out in paperback earlier this year. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Karen Salt, 
who is an assistant professor in transnational American studies at Nottingham University, an expert on sovereignty, politics, and the ways that discourses regarding difference influence narratives, decision-making, and systems of governance. And she currently leads or co-leads projects on reparative trust, collective activism, racial equity, and transformative justice politics. Next, we'll go to Robert Berkeley, uh, currently broadcasting editor at Blackout UK, a not-for-profit social enterprise run and owned by a volunteer collective of black gay men. He was director of the Runnymede Trust from 2009 to 2014. And alongside his academic writing on education, social justice, and community organizing, he's presented and co-produced short documentaries and written for The Guardian and The Independent on racial justice. Dr. Berkeley was awarded an MBE in 2015 for services to equality. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What a great reminder. Please turn your phones to silence <laughs> while tweeting. That, um... <laughs> Does your MBE always get that response? Yeah, often. <laughs> and finally, uh, it's a great pleasure to hear from Heaton Shah. He's the executive director of the Royal Statistical Society. I should declare at this point, of which I am a member. Uh, it's a membership body with a vision for data to be at the heart of understanding and decision making. He's also visiting professor at the Policy Institute, King's College London, and chair of the Friends Provident Foundation, a trust seeking a fairer economy, and a member of the Social Metrics Commission, which is seeking new measures of poverty for the UK. So the fantastic panel, and clearly it's an insult to them to ask them to keep their contribution so short, but that's the price we pay for also wanting to hear from you guys. Uh, are you going to present from the thing, because you have slides? Yes. So uh, first off, we're gonna hear from Dr. Sandra Wachter. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, yes, so I'm a lawyer and researcher in data ethics. So I focus on the legal and ethical implications of machine learning and AI and robotics. And I'm very excited to be on this very, very important panel to discuss this crucial issue with you. And I've named my talk Diversity as a Holistic Approach because I actually feel a lot of problems that we have with inequality stem from a lack of diversity. And I have listed here a couple of things that I would like to briefly discuss because I think the other speakers are going to dive into those things a bit more in detail. Um, I think it's very important to keep in mind that diversity is not just a box taking exercise, right? It's not just something that we do because we have to do. It's actually a common threat that runs throughout different topics. And I've listed here a couple of topics that are very close to my heart and I think are very important to keep in mind and are actually a problem um, and actually the root of a lot of the problems that we're facing right now. I mean, the first is obviously um, the lack of diversity in data sets. I think the other speakers are gonna talk about this more. But of course, data is biased because the world is biased. And if we don't um, keep that in mind and have systems or researchers that are aware of that, we just gonna replicate the bad decisions we made in the past into the future. So having a rich and diverse data set is very important if you actually wanna tackle inequality. Um, the second thing is obviously the tech community is not very diverse and that's a big problem because if you have a very, you know, um, not a diverse tech community, obviously their stereotypes, their biases will be embedded into the systems that they develop. So not just this inequality and biases creeping into the data sets, but also actually in the systems because the people who develop them are biased. Um, the third thing is also very important is the lack of diversity in research groups. And we talk about a lot of problems with AI, um, and that's most of the time not just a tech problem, right? We think about how does AI challenge our legal system, right? Are the laws that we have still good enough to guard against those risks? That's a legal question. We think about how does AI affect our workforce, for example? That's an economics question. So I actually need economics experts to think about that. Think about the ethical questions that uh, rise from that, obviously philosophers are the ones that need to um, think about that. And how does technology shape political discourse, you know, opinion building? That's for um, political scientists to decide. So this is something, you see that those problems come from technology, but actually the answers are probably in the diverse research communities and we don't see them so much yet. And one of the problems why we don't have so many um, diverse research groups yet is because, well, sorry. Sorry, um, it's because um, there's still 
bias and the lack of diversity in funding and institutions. If you look at the whole the funding scheme at the moment, a lot of money is pumped into STEM, but actually the social sciences, the humanities, don't get as much funding anymore, even though those, those are the disciplines that could help us to solve all those problems that I just talked about. And the same comes for the, for the institutions. It's very much siloed. There's not much of a dialogue going on between different disciplines, and that's a very pro big problem. But even if you have the funding, and even if the institutions and the people who want to work together, um, there's a problem in terms of publishing. So researchers wanting to publish their, their, their findings, having trouble to find diverse journals. For example, if you want to publish a paper that is very you know, heavy on tech and very heavy on law, um, it's very hard to find journals that actually cater for that. So you don't actually have the venue and the audience to read that. And the last point is obviously um, policy solutions. Um, as I said, the problems are very diverse. And therefore, that means we need not just different disciplines working on this together, but also different stakeholders. It's very important that when we think about strategies to mitigate those risks, we need people from industry, government, um, academia, but also from civil society, NGOs, and most importantly, we actually need representatives of the general public. So that could be, for example, union groups or consumer protection groups, because those are the people at the end that are going to be affected by AI, and those people need to have a voice as well. So I guess what I'm saying, the most important thing is to think about diversity as a holistic concept. And if we have that in mind, we can actually come up with solutions that harness the full potential of AI without tapping into the pitfalls that we see. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I didn't even get to use my yellow card. What a good clean game we're running. <laughs> So next, uh, Catherine, you, would you like to speak from there, from, from over here? Would you like to walk around? Would, feel free, <laughs> whatever makes you most comfortable. Fire away, I'll off start, you go. I'll start seated <laughs> and with a timer because you've got me so scared. <laughs> so there. Sorry, they didn't let me bring my electric shock machine. It can't get that bad. Um, so sometimes lack of data is very useful. Uh, if I had known the data about the probability of a new political party succeeding, I probably would not have founded the Women's Equality Party. Um, there, I started it against all of the uh, odds of a party succeeding in a first-past-the-post system and in a system that has rules um, that are supposed to create stability but actually just end up enshrining the dominance of existing parties and upholding the status quo. Um, when I say how a party succeeds, of course, that depends whether you measure success only in terms of the numbers of seats won. I took as an unlikely role model UKIP. Um, this was 2015 when I co-founded the Women's Equality Party. We hadn't had Brexit yet, but it was clear by then even so, that UKIP was creating seismic change without winning seats. At its most, they only ever had one MP. And it was because of the weakness of the big parties that instead of challenging and pushing back against UKIP's politics, saw what they were doing as a vote winner and started trying to steal their thunder. So I thought what in fact, I could do is show that gender equality was a vote winner and they would start to co copy us and that turns out to work. But of course, there's something else UKIP was doing. We saw them using and misusing data, um, both false data to suggest a kind of Brexit dividend that would never happen. And also, of course, there has been this whole issue around micro-targeting of voters and what that looked like and how that came about. If there is time, I will talk more about Cambridge Analytica and, and that whole issue. Um, the, our, our success is continuing. We are growing as a party. We are having electoral success. We are having success in using data for social change. Data is absolutely essential to solving inequality. You can't prove inequality without it. You can't prove the benefits of resolving inequality without it. And you can't understand what the mechanisms of inequality are unless you also look at the data. I'll give you one example here. Recently, of course, the biggest UK companies were forced to reveal their gender pay gaps. The, level, the, the efforts that they went to to 
uh, some of them went to at any rate, not to report properly, to obfuscate those gaps, told its own story. And it was very imperfect data. Um, sometimes what you were seeing was real pay discrimination, which of course is illegal, lumped in with all sorts of other structural reasons that were causing that. And as I say, very data that you couldn't challenge and interrogate and all sorts of weaknesses. Um, opponents of that reporting suggested that what uh, was needed was to get rid of that reporting again, whereas in fact, of course, what we need is more data, not less. Um, we need it to be broken down by uh, other aspects as well, such as ethnicity and age and disability, and smaller companies need to be reporting it. But as I say, data can actually help in solving inequality. However, and this is to something Sandra said, data inequality in various forms is a very real thing. There's a power imbalance between individuals and the corporations and the governments that hold and process their data. And of course, there's about how we collect data, what the data is. As Sandra said, data is biased because the world is biased. And there's a, gender, uh, there's a, a danger that data will be used, for example, or, or will inadvertently create normative or exacerbating trends that make worse things that already work. Recommend a book by Virginia Eubanks called Automating Inequality. Um, I, uh, the first big donation that we got for our, our party was to go on a software platform called Nation Builder. This is a kind of platform, and that platform indeed specifically used by nearly all parties in the world. Uh, they've got Emmanuel Macron on their website at the moment. Um, and it is because you need some kind of way of interfacing between your website, between the data that you collect when you're out canvassing, your uh, mailing list, your membership, your donors, and social media. But those kinds of software are also ones that you pay according to your ability. And of course, for a small party like us, we have the bare minimum but the big parties are already using micro-targeting in very major ways. They are, used, they are scraping every legitimately available source um, in order to do it. And it is further adding to a system that is incredibly unfair. In to, you know, there is no such thing as an, an equal starting place in democracy. And interestingly, in the responses to Cambridge Analytica, the suggestions that have been made about how to fix this are nearly all about ladling on additional bureaucracy, which of course will affect parties with less money more. And rich people and rich parties have always found ways to get around these things. So um, I really wanted to, to make that, that point um, as a starting point, but, but there is so much to say on this subject um, in terms of how how data can go wrong, but how it could go very right. And I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that we all have to engage with this in order to get the outcomes that we need. Excellent, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I'm going to interfere, my little cards are going to stay in their case, <laughs> which is probably the best way. I was so, 30 seconds under. Oh, <laughs> look at that, you see, that's data. <laughs> There you go. Uh, although, you know, we should calibrate and check that we're all using the same. Exactly. No, that was excellent. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyway, Dr. Salt. Yes, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I'm going to jump straight in uh, to, to my thoughts. Um, I've got lots of little arrows and things circled around here, um, and I'll try to narrow them down. Um, everyone's brought up some really key points that I think I would probably say ditto to quite a few of them. Um, but I think one of the crucial things for me that, that, uh, that starts sort of at the, at the beginning is information. We've been saying the word data, um, but we're actually talking about information. And quite critically for me, there's those questions of, of for whom? Um, you know, who is the intended, intended audience for this set of information? Uh, Catherine's told us about uh, micro-targeting and the parties trying to get particular sets of data and information, but what is the intended aim of other sets of information that might be coming together? And now imagine if you have corporate-controlled information filters and bubbles. 
So suddenly you're going around and having sets of information and you think you may be giving access to their various things, but there's another corporate group that's making a whole set of decisions over here about your content and moving that information around. Um, much less things that, uh, that I think Sandra was mentioning about um, algorithmic decision making that's proprietary. You'll never get access to it. So if you're a CIC or a company, you're trying to get access to that information, but not necessarily in any way that you can manipulate that set of information. Um, it's proprietary. So I think there's a really key place to start with around data in the largest sense, and most definitely around um, what we maybe consider tech-driven information about its supposed neutrality. Um, Sandra's already kind of pushed us to really kind of think about that from the development perspective, but I think we've got to really start to think about that, especially if we're thinking of, about something like inequalities, right? Um, and if we're really, really wanting to understand that, then we really need to be figuring out how to do that. We need all sets of tools to really get at that. And I'm going to agree with Catherine that data and various forms of information gathering could be a way forward. And it's not, I think, making the claim about bias just being everywhere is, is I, I appreciate it, but I try to live in a world that, is, that, I, that I want to imagine that is full of justice. So I can't live in a world where I think bias is just normative, and therefore I should just sit quite comfortably with all of these biases around me. I want to work on adequately trying to expose them and ultimately trying to reduce them, because that's the only way I can imagine a just future for myself um, and for all of you in this room. So there's this question about what are our tools that we need to try to reduce inequality. Data could be one, but data and technology is not the answer, nor is it the solution. Um, because for me, something quite critical exists around all of this, um, and I have a feeling that Rob's probably gonna pick up on some of this, but we need critical analysis of all of the sets of information. We really need adequate, really critical, reflexive, uh, tools that can actually debunk and kind of deconstruct racialized notions of difference about people, hierarchies of being, and questions about power. Um, and until we do that, we're really going to be replicating the system, no matter if you can come up with the most powerful analytics um, or, or sort of tech-driven kind of place, but it's still in the hands of decision makers that are just going to perpetuate the same sort of boundaries that we've got set up. So I think it's really critical if we're going to end up with justice, whether or not it's digital justice or tech justice, that we really quite critically think about the decision making that we've got. Catherine's mentioned quite, um, um, uh, I think, cogently about the parties, but there's a whole bunch of decision making happening everywhere from the very micro level uh, in the local environment to the national and international level. And if we turn all of our sets of decision making over to an algorithm or a set of corporations or a set of people making lots of decisions about your lives, we run the risk of actually never knowing and never actually actively engaging with trying to transform the worlds around us. And that's a concern for me, a, a very deep concern. So I'm, I'm about the data, and I'm critically thinking about the inequality. But for me, it's really about trying to, to not replicate power dynamics um, in either of those places that essentially just keep us in the same space that we've always been in. Excellent. Thank you very much. At precisely the point you mentioned, you believe in justice, I drank your beer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I hope it was good. <laughs> well, don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Rob. Uh, uh, great to be here. And uh, I just want to echo some of the points that people have made already, but also uh, throw in a kind of voice of caution. And hopefully not gloom and doom, but, but caution. Um, I'm a bit of an interloper. I'm, I, in some ways, I, I'm a really early adopter of, uh, of new tech. I get really excited about all the possibilities. Possibly overexcited. Uh, so some of what I say may you may, may need to take with a, with a pinch of salt. But after 25 years uh, as an activist, thinking about issues around racial justice, uh, I'm qualified as a sociologist of education, uh, having spent the last three years as an audience data specialist at the at the BBC, um, and really, as a child of the, uh, of, uh, who came to political consciousness in the 90s, uh, a technocrat, like all good New Labour types are. Um, it, it, it sometimes pains me a little bit to, to, to talk down what data uh, can do, uh, and, and its position and role in, in creating social change. Um, <coughs> 
so starting really with the history of enumerating uh, populations by characteristics, by uh, identifications that they may have or may be ascribed to them, isn't a happy or pleasant one. Think pink triangles, think yellow stars, uh, think the request for papers, please. Um, the categorizations that are given are, are more often about the concerns of the powerful than the, than the drive towards justice. Um, and they're inherently political. Um, think of the, the, the categorizations uh, that we grew up with thinking about uh, race and racial justice. Uh, old and new Commonwealth migrants, remember that one? Or, uh, or BME, to refer to, to, to lump all people of color together, because otherwise we know much more about uh, second generation Poles and how well they're doing in, in school. Um, these categorizations are driven by policy um, and, uh, and driven by uh, political concerns. And so it's always relevant to, when, when confronted with data to ask, well, why this data and not, uh, not something else being collected here? Um, it's, it's both, uh, it's indicative of the, the level at which uh, the politics uh, pervades any discussions around data, particularly ethnic data, um, when you get uh, campaigns and people driving to be included uh, within, uh, within a set of new set of categorizations, whether that's Cornish language, whether that's Turkish groups, whether that's in 2011 the Arab group being added to the census, not because of size but because of GCHQ. Uh, I can just work out kind of how that, how and why that happens. Um, but Fundamentally, uh, I, I think it's based on, the, there's, a, there's a basis on which data scientists somehow believe that evidence changes practice. Uh, and I think we have to question whether that is true uh, or, or not, uh, or whether we, we, we actually are in a situation where we're, where we're making evidence-based policy, or we're making politics-based policy and bringing some evidence in mm -hmm. uh, towards the ends to justify it. So my first foray into activism was uh, a battle about data. I started university, I started at Oxford in October 1992. Uh, by January 93, um, I started, a, I become engaged in a battle with the university about data. That's, I guess, the nature of uh, being one of the few black students at Oxford, right? Um, and there's a table in the Oxford Gazette, uh, table 9A, if I remember rightly, um, that changed my life. Ter terrible to say. but. Uh, in it, I could see that I was one of 16 uh, black students in my year at that university. Um, last year, it was four black British students. So actually, we're going backwards rather than forwards with that group. But, it, um, but that table raised so many questions. Uh, so, so white students had a one in three chance of, of being successful in, the, in those admissions rounds. Black students and Bangladeshi students had a one in five chance of being successful. Um, and that year, 93, and almost every year since, there's been a battle with Oxford University about that data. Um, so much so that I've just got so bored of that conversation that I've farmed it out to the very capable MP for Tottenham, who's, uh, <laughs> uh, who, who's doing very well with it currently. But, but there's a cycle where, in 1998, uh, the university uh, would deny the truth of, of their own data and send us back for more. Um, in 2008, they withdrew publishing the data. Uh, in 2018, they're back to denying the data is true again. Mm -hmm. So we're in a kind of political round with data. And actually, the data is not the important thing in that discussion anymore, but a kind of conception about what is the good life, what is justice, etc. cetera. Um, so that pattern of disbelief, denial, and victim blaming are to be expected because the data is released into a space which is racist. So, so, uh, so white supremacy will, will encourage and reinforce its pattern. Uh, and, and, um, and actually looking at the way in which data is received and understood and analysed uh, in, in part reinforces some of those patterns of exclusion and inclusion. Mm. Um, finally, I, I think, should I come, are we going on? Um, <laughs> just a, a point really about that the, the data is never enough. Um, so I've been guilty in the past of confusing battles for transparency of data for battles for equality. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not the same thing mm. and often uh, we can set off in very wrong directions trying to get more data. If we just had the data, they just believe us and then things will change, actually, no. Um, so I completely applaud the work of the Race Disparity Unit at, at number 10 currently. I've pulled together some fantastic data um, and, and some of, the, and some of the, 
the best uh, work I've seen on, on, on mapping ethnic disparities. What I don't know is what, that relationship is what the relationship is between that collection of, and presentation of data and social change. Um, and, um, and, I, and I worry that waving, we've got the data, uh, is used as a, uh, as, a, as a way of pretending that there's activity going on. Um, so we should be careful not to think that producing data is doing the work. Um, and, and similarly, if more data is published, and, and, I, and I, I hope that we, we get better and better data from, uh, from AI, etc., um, there must be a demand for analysis. There's no benefit in, uh, in establishing a race, race disparity unit at number 10. Uh, and then cutting the funding for uh, for university research, or cutting the funding for civil society to analyse that data, because no change will happen. Um, so for me, the question about data is not so much the quality of the data or how much data there is, but what that data can do to transform the relationships between people, because uh, it's inserted into a political space where we have to think about the political change that we require, not just the scientific data collection. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're all doing terribly well sticking to time. It's marvellous. Peter, can you, can you keep this clear round for me? Well, if I can bank everyone else's time, no. I think I... Uh, <laughs> so I'm from the Royal Statistical Society, uh, and it's uh, highly amusing that you've decided to spend your kind of warm Wednesday evening in a room uh, discussing data and inequality. Of course, if, you, if we... Given it its proper title, which is Statistics of Inequality, none of you would have come. So uh, we as a society have been around for 184 years. We're delighted that everyone else has sort of caught up and the, the flag of data is suddenly a kind of advertising agency for statistics. So uh, welcome to my world. Um, I, I want to introduce you to... Uh, has anyone heard of the, the rock star statistician Hans Rosling, who died about a year ago? Uh, a few of you have. So he uh, uh, had this word, factfulness, uh, which I love. Uh, and the idea is that it would be a really good thing if we knew some facts. Uh, and because we all go around and we sort of know the facts are there, we can kind of access them at any time, but actually they're not in our brains right now. Uh, and so what he does, and I'm not going to do it to you, but he, he does it, uh, he asks his audience, you know, here's three choices. What's been happening to extreme poverty? Uh, what's been happening to this, that, and the other. And basically, the audience gets it so badly wrong that chimpanzees just throwing darts would have been better uh, at answering these questions. So we just don't actually have a good idea of the world that we're living in. And I was looking in advance of this talk uh, at some of the income inequality data. Uh, and you know, as I say, I'm not going to test you, but it's interesting. We, we assume, I think, and many of us, that UK income inequality has been getting worse and worse in recent years. Actually, it's been pretty static for the last 20 years. Now, that doesn't mean it's too high or too low. I mean, we, we can argue about that, but it's quite useful to have some facts. At the very top 1%, things are getting uh, much worse, but for the other 99%, it's been pretty static for the last 20 years. So, uh, as I say, I'm not, I'm not therefore then saying what are the political implications of this, but it's quite useful to know. The other one, there's a fantastic website called Our World in Data, which I really recommend to you. And what they do is they take the kind of the statistic things really seriously and go back to the 1200s and say, what's the very long run data trend here? Uh, so I was looking at income inequality from their website. And uh, if I can find my uh, bit, it's sort of from 1600 to 1900, the data suggests in the UK, 35 to 40% of income went to the top 5%. Uh, and then it was in the 1900s, uh, in the 20th century, that really dropped all the way to the 1970s. And then in the 70s and 80s, went massively worse again, and now has sort of plateaued. Um, this is interesting stuff, right? What we do with it, that's for us to argue about in terms of our politics. But it's quite useful to have some facts. And so I really commend the kind of Hans Rosling approach to factfulness, and I sort of suggest you, you read his book. Having said that, we have pretty good data in the UK for some things. Uh, but there are some areas where I think we're very weak. Wealth data uh, is not very good. So we've got reasonably good income data, but not very good wealth data. We could get better at tracking the very wealthiest. So when we're doing uh, inequality, we're not bad at the bottom end, but it's pretty hard to know what's going on at that top 1%. So it would be very good to see more. 
And our regional data is appalling. And in a sense, it's the EU referendum stuff that has suddenly woken everyone in London up to the fact that there are these places outside of London uh, and that we really ought to know what's going on in them. But we haven't got much further than that. But the, th the theory is there. So you know, let, let, let's work on that. So, so those are kind of your traditional statsy type issues. I thought I might make a bit of a foray into kind of Sandra's new tech territory as well. Uh, bias is, is a really big issue. So they're starting to use algorithms in the US uh, to decide uh, on your likelihood to reoffend if you sentenced in the sort of criminal justice system. Uh, some brilliant uh, journalists have shone a light on this and showed that even though it doesn't use race uh, in, in that uh, data set uh, directly, actually it, it, it does, uh, through correlations, uh, is biased against uh, you, you know, if you're, if you're a black man, uh, it's much more likely to assume that you're gonna reoffend uh, and wrongly assume that, uh, that than if you're white. So as algorithms start permeating through policy making, uh, th these risks become very real. And in the UK, you might remember uh, a few weeks ago uh, that there was evidence that uh, a number of people were deported because they, they weren't deemed as speaking English language sufficiently well. These were students. Uh, but I think, I mean, I can't quite remember, but the error rate on the algorithm was something like 20%. So the estimation was that 7,000 people have been deported wrongly. So error rates start, I mean, it doesn't really matter if you're Amazon and they send you the wrong good or they advertise the wrong book to you, because who cares? In the commercial world, it doesn't matter. But once these things start creeping into public life, it does matter. That said, you can turn these tools around to use them for usefulness as well. So uh, some people have recently designed a new HR algorithm, which knows what human biases are. You know, you prefer the f first and last candidates and you forget the ones in the middle, uh, all these sorts of things. So they give you, they don't tell you the name uh, of the candidate, so you can't kind of get, be biased uh, against people because of their funny sounding name or because they're a man or a woman. Uh, they randomize the order in which you, you see the candidate question by question. So you'll see question six from candidate three and then uh, question four from candidate seven. And you can't be biased because you know, you've got no idea who, who or what is coming at you. So these are ways of using uh, some of these new data tools in a way to actually promote fairness. But you've got to build it in and design it from the start as it were. Uh, similarly, uh, satellite data, you can use satellite data, people are using it to spot sites for modern day slavery. So there are opportunities, but at the end of the day, what, what, do we, what is it we care about? That's what drives data, which is I think the, the thing that all uh, the, the panel have been saying. I'll say uh, one more thing, uh, which is that the, the, the one thing that's worrying me at the moment is the, the rise of private sector companies uh, who are gaining a larger and larger share of data. So historically what's happened is that uh, the state has been the one that's amassed data the, through the census and those sorts of things. Uh, and some of that has then been used for research purposes, for public good aims, to inform public policy, where schools should be built, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're giving away more and more of our data to uh, giant companies. And Again, I don't care in the short run if, if I give my data to Amazon and they want to recommend a product to me, that's not a big deal. But where will we be in 30 or 40 years time? There will be enormous amounts of personal data held by private sector companies, probably three or four of them. Uh, and we as the public will have no access to that. Academics won't necessarily have access to that unless the private sector decide that that's what they want to do. But it's our data, right? So I would like us to sort of think about what, where do we want to get to in 30 or 40 years time? Uh, one idea that I've floated is that in the way that intellectual property rights, companies have a right to uh, a new idea, they've got a license over it for a short period of time, but after that, uh, everybody has access. Uh, so you know we've seen that with uh, uh, ibuprofen, Nurofen used to have the, the patents on it, but now you can buy it for 16 pence in the supermarket because any company can produce it. In the same way, what if the, uh, the rights that companies had over our data were also time limited? So they could hold it for five years or something like that, enough time to sell us whatever the latest gadget is, after which it would revert into some kind of public trust uh, held by uh, an arm's length charitable corporation. Uh, and then it could be used for uh, purposes to actually say, 
you know, what's in the public good? Because there's all this amazing data. We could do lots of good with it. Uh, but as always, the question is political as to who owns it. Thank you very much. Right, they all kept admirably to time, so I am going to monopolise them for just a few minutes with my own thoughts and questions. Thank you all. You have covered an enormous amount of ground there and raised so many issues. We're certainly not going to answer all those questions in the next hour. Uh, but it, it seems there are a few common directions emerging, one of which is bias. So I suppose I'd just like to unpack that a little. The idea of bias kind of within the data and the AI, where do you think we can address that? Because th there's a whole process going on, isn't there? There's, there's, there's the collection of data, there's deciding what to collect, then there's the, the processing and the analysis of that data, and then there is, if you like, the application and uh, who, well, that's who gets access to it, of course, but there's, there's how that then gets translated. Does it get translated into uh, recommendation for sentencing? Does it get translated into where economic growth happens? I, can I ask you to unpack that a little bit for me and, and maybe draw out the different areas in the process where, where bias happens? And you know, if you feel so bold, suggest some things we can do about it, but even just... A, a kind of a deeper understanding of when we talk about, oh, the data is biased, where does that come from and what do we mean? Who would like to, to jump in first? You're sitting nodding very wisely. <laughs> I mean, clearly um, some points that, that were very important were made by Rob and Karen about um, what bias actually looks like, what we're talking about here. So. I'm engaged in politics in part of my life because I think politics is one way of tackling, actually of exposing and tackling and bias. But um, the political party I'm involved in also, for example, believes in campaigning for um, a less biased media and looking at education you know, at the very beginning of all of this. And so on the one hand, you're talking about huge the huge cultural issue of of the, the cultural soup we're swimming in and, and who's determining in it, it and how we change it. But you're also talking about things like, you know, to Sandra's point about diversity not being a tick box exercise, it really matters that the big tech companies are so, uh, are, and, and that the technology that is being designed is being done so by such a tiny proportion of the population. If you look at the things that people decide to design, you understand something about the lives they lead because you see the things that they, you know, they think it's incredibly important to have a service that does your laundry for you. Um, or they will also do things like sort of moonshot technologies that are supposed to solve great inequalities which they themselves are helping to create. Um, you know, so, so there is an awful lot of circular thinking. And um, in terms of those algorithms you were talking I mean they're separate things then there is the very human bias which is there and it's deep and it's cultural and it requires that kind of rigorous analysis in order to understand it when I was talking about data being important I think data is vastly important but I absolutely agree that how it is used and interpreted it's it's not it's not there in a vacuum and actually to get people to act on it on ways you want it's then around the narrative you tell but in terms of, in terms of how, how we, we deal with things, uh, to, uh, how we address the bias in, in algorithms, that starts with how we address who it is who's creating them and what it is that they're drawing on. And that's where you get you know, this, this problem where it exacerbates existing inequalities rather than, than solving them so many times. Um, so it's because, I mean, the example that you mentioned about the prison, the prison sentences, mm -hmm. that's a classic one. It's because of the data that they think are relevant to reoffending, are data that they haven't even realised are racialised data. And so they, they create this outcome by feeding that data in. So you need to step way back from the process. 
as to why anybody thought that was a good idea, why anybody didn't notice it, and why it is that once people noticed it, it not only kept being used, but is being used increasingly widely to what effect. This, this is actually a really interesting example because, like probably all of you, I, uh, I read about the algorithm. It's called Compass. It's designed by a comp company called North Point. Uh, and then I read the ProPublica coverage, which said, well, we have followed a number of the people uh, in, I think it was Florida, who had, were given risk scores by this algorithm, and we follow their outcome, and we can show you that. Exactly as you said, if you are black, you're much more likely to get a false positive, to be falsely flagged as high risk. And if you're white, you're much more likely to get a false negative, to be falsely flagged as low risk. But then the company came back and said, uh, this is an unfair interpretation. Uh, and what they, what they claimed, which I am told by people who have gone into the statistics in more detail, is that... This is because the underlying populations, in fact, have different rates of being rearrested. I think that's probably the, the fairest way to put it. And that therefore you are dealing with basic populations that are dissimilar. And if you make the algorithm fair on the way in, so if you treat every individual the same the way in, then it's unfair on the way out if you look at it by groups. And this, uh, I, I actually did, um, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to monopolise slightly, I, I did a really interesting event at the Royal Society recently with Professor Cynthia Dwork, who's precisely looking at this as a technical issue, as an algorithmic issue. And she said, well, the problem is it's mathematically impossible to design an algorithm that is fair from every possible definition of fairness. Yes. Uh, and so this idea that you can make an algorithm which somehow compensates for human bias or for the unfairness of the world in which we're living is fanciful because the way you define the fairness you're looking for will define what you what you get out. Uh, but this, I think, throws up a really interesting question because it basically throws the problem back into our laps. Mm -hmm. We have to define what fairness looks like, what equality looks like, mm -hmm. in order to go back and design the algorithm. Rob, are you yeah, no, to I, get in? I think that was the, the, the point I was trying to make, that we, can't, we haven't given up on <laughs> politics yet, that, that actually... Um, these are these are tools which we might choose to use to inform the debate and discussion. But they don't replace no. the debate and yeah. discussion. Yeah. Yes. And, and I have a a, a real worry about uh, as as Karen was, was was described much more eloquently than I than I could around uh, our expectations of of, of, of others. So uh, suggesting that people are seven and a half percent biased in this direction or 25% or biased in another direction and that we can just correct for it by somehow fixing their mobile phone. Um, yeah. Feels to me, not just, yeah. not just fanciful, but, but actually damaging to the, to the kind of human empathy we need to create to create the kind of new yeah. politics yeah. and a new society. Yeah. Yeah. I, think yeah. it's, I think it's like, I very much agree with you. I think it's two things. I think there's a belief that somehow data is neutral and there's a good kind of data that is not biased in any yeah. way, and that's a fallacy. There is no such thing as neutral data. So I was hosting a workshop a couple of months back, <coughs> and I would say it was like 15 people in total, three of them were women. When we're talking about biases and decision-making on how to who to hire, basically, there was the whole thing, well, we the, the, the men said we developed an algorithm that is very good, and um, you know, making sure that we increase equality. Like, how you do that? Well, we get rid of all the data that is, you know, not neutral. It's like, how did you do that? So, so yeah, we're not using names anymore. We're not using pictures. We're just using neutral data. And I was like, well, what's that? So, yeah, we're gonna use, you know, um, the employment history and salaries. <laughs> <laughs> and the free room were like, what? <laughs> And that's the problem. Like they, I think this is where bias also comes from from the people because apparently men, you know, you mm. just don't think about the problems that other members of the community have, yeah. and think, yeah, you're just going to take that neutral thing like income or employment history to make those decisions, right? And the other thing is, um, even if you have those data, and even if you know that those inequalities happen, okay, we know that. We know that the world is sexist. We know it's racist the next step is to do something against that, right? Absolutely. It's not just, we're not going to tweak the algorithm, make the algorithm less racist, or make the data look less racist. Well, actually, we need to work on 
us be less racist yeah. and make less racist decisions and offer equal opportunity to those people. Like, that's the real issue, actually. Data might help you to figure out what the problems lie, but if you want to change that, it's human action, not robot action. Absolutely. Exactly. I'd agree with that. I would, yeah. I'd also stress that um, uh, there's a whole raft of folks who've been writing on this issue. Um, uh, uh, Sophia Noble is one who's written a book called Algorithms of Oppression. Um, but a lot of that is asking about what are the schemas, what are the, the sort of corpus, what's the kind of knowledge that's being generated to populate these algorithms. So it's not as if the algorithms dropped from the algorithm tree um, <laughs> and then just sort of did stuff. Somebody's made it know stuff to be able to do stuff. So that knowing is critical to try to figure out what is the basis of all of that. And I think people have to take ownership and responsibility for the things they're coding, the words that they're creating, and the, and the worlds that they're imagining and producing at all stages. It's not necessarily just the tech aspects of it. It's also the presumptions when I might walk into certain buildings in my university and I'm assumed to be the cleaner. No, I'm being very serious. That that is the only, that is the limitation of the world building that there's some people can do. That means that it doesn't actually matter. And I think going back to Rob's point, in some cases, it actually doesn't matter how much data you do, you create. There are certain things in certain spaces, and we've, we've been able to bo borrow this from people who have been working on um, um, structural racism and just sort of racist thinkings from people who've been investigating climate change, that there is a very large pervasive aspect of ignorance. That is, that is, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's actually understood now as a theory of this resistance to data. Mm -hmm. So we, we make the presumption that you just fill up the data tree with more information, and then I, we just put it out there to people, and everyone just goes, aha, I will now stop being a horrible, bigot, racist, <laughs> nasty person because you now told me with all of this data you assembled, and I'm good to go. And actually, the resistance to that is really quite strong. So I think we've got to take quite critically, while we're also talking about these algorithms, what we're talking about around inequalities. And we're talking often about sustained, structural, systemic, long-term problematics. They might deviate, different bodies might move in there, but as a process, we're talking about stuff that's just not shifting because, you know, because people are bored or they're tired and they, or they just need more data. It's like we've got to be much more creative to really try to analyze and understand that and not just think if we build a better, a better tech ship, we will therefore just make the world equitable. It's, just, it just, it's a ludicrous concept, and I think it, it, it puts a lot of emphasis on the data to magically fix stuff, and it also presum presumes, I think, Sandra's point, that that data is neutral, right? Uh, before, yeah, before I come out to this, Heaton, your, your day job is kind of trying to get the data or statistics, as we secretly call it, <laughs> when we're meeting alone in the Royal <laughs> Statistical Society, uh, but to get the data and actually try and use it in some way to do things, to shift policy, to, to make the world a better place. And this is the, the historical mission of the Royal Statistical Society is not just to get better stats, but to do that, to make the world a better place. Can you, can you give us a few maybe pointers about that? Uh, before I throw open to the audience, because there's sure, a nice well, let, warm let, debate going there. Let, let, let me just kind of respond a little bit to yeah. what's been said. I mean, uh, you know, I, I agree with uh, everything that's been said. Having said that, the... <laughs> no, no, I, I want to make a couple... I am of... trying to foster some disagreement. I, 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 I know you do, exactly. That's part, partly it. But I also I want to make some distinctions, because, you know, we all want to make the world a better place, but earlier we were saying all data is biased. But let, let's unpack the ways in which it can be biased, because there are different ways in which it can be biased. Also, the fact that data in of itself doesn't change the world by itself doesn't therefore mean data, good data is not a useful thing. <laughs> so good data is the bedrock of democracy, right? Because if we can't agree on facts, which we then have a disagreement about what we therefore do about them, that, that is a foundation for a, a, a useful conversation, as it were. So, you know, that's why statisticians, I think, play a really important role in saying, here are some facts. Now you go away and beat the crap out of each other to say what <laughs> we should do about it, right? But let's at least try and agree some facts. And one of the worries at the moment uh, in the so-called post-truth world is that we're not even being able to agree on w what society we're inhabiting, as it were. Uh, and that feels quite concerning to me. Well, on the issue of bias, 
Yes, all data is biased, but let, let, let's think that there are different ways of doing this. Um, there are things called official statistics, which are produced by the uh, Office for National Statistics and other statisticians in government, uh, and these are quality assured. Now, these are biased in certain ways because the government decides what to measure and what not to measure. Uh, and uh, uh, Will Moy, uh, who runs Full Fact, uh, which is a fact-checking char charity, yesterday gave a really interesting example. He said the Office for National Statistics brings out its baby names uh, list every year. And this is the ONS being its most frivolous. It gets a nice media hit in August, you know, what are the top 20 baby names? This feels to them like it's not political, but of course, one of the things they do is that they <coughs> uh, don't look at the name Mohammed uh, according to the sound. They distinguish the different ways it's spelt. Uh, as a result, Mohammed is not listed as one of the top baby names in the country, whereas if it was how the name sounds rather than how it was spelt, because it's spelt in many different ways, uh, it may well be the top or one of the top baby names, as it were. So what gets counted counts. Mm -hmm. uh, so even in official statistics, these political choices impinge all the time. That said, this data does tell you something. As it were. We've always got to question it, but you know, there is quality in the sort of survey design, uh, they, they, there's a sort of representativeness, et cetera, et cetera. In the sort of new world of data that we're in, where there's digital data floating around all over the place, uh, <coughs> Twitter, for example, people have started doing polling on Twitter uh, some people have started looking at, you know, can we see what's going to happen in the election because of what's going on in Twitter? No is the answer, right? Because no matter how good your techniques are, the point is Twitter is a very small sample and a very biased sample. <coughs> so there are biases and biases, as it were, and I think that it's just worth distinguishing between methodological biases uh, and <coughs> the kind of biases that are in any data set uh, which reflect the world that we're in. On the note, I'm going to come out and we want to hear what, what you have to say. Uh, so, <coughs> you actually need some more water. Uh, if um, we have some roving <coughs> microphones, uh, could we have a little bit more <coughs> to the audience so we can check they're still listening? Not just check the <coughs> football scores on their phones. Uh, excellent. <coughs> Good. Welcome. You can see your faces now. Uh, we have a couple of roving microphones, one over there and one over there. So stick your hands up. Uh, oh, look at you all go. Excellent. Right, so I'm going to ask you to be concise. Would you like to start with that microphone there, <coughs> just because you can see that person? And over there, there is there a hand over that side? I'm afraid you're going to have to go back up to the top at the back there, sorry. <coughs> this is where the volunteers get incredibly fit by running around. Do you have the microphone? If so, start speaking now. Hi. Um, so thank you for your talk. I found them really <coughs> interesting. Uh, my question is, how do you think we can or should use data to successfully not set back equality within society? Good, excellent, <laughs> large question, but um, open for plenty of answers. I'm really worried about you now. Are you okay? Do you need yeah. to? Uh, so if you'd like to get that microphone back, and you've got the mic, and if you'd like to give that one to that person there in the blue for next. Okay, you at the back. Okay. Hello. Um, so the government recently launched the Ethnicity Facts and Figures website, and um, for me that was really interesting because it had a like 150 different topics about how your ethnicity can impact your experience of public services, healthcare, education, etc. Um, if you were that team, what would you do with that data to inform it as a powerful tool to improve society? Marvelous. Lovely specific question. I like those. Uh, and who has the microphone there? <coughs> Blue top. Yes. Um, hi, so some, it's come up that sometimes um, if you're starting with the data, it is always re reflecting um, these problematic biases in society. So the criminal justice system data um, is, is, I don't think it's necessarily impossible to, to kind of mitigate the biases. I've read a, an interesting paper by Christiane Lum in the US, which was um, kind of remodeling and actually seems to have come up with uh, a, a way of potentially doing it. So I think it's, it's a field that, you know, you have to keep watching and see if it comes up with that type of solution. But I also think um, the way you've got that type of problem, um, do we need to go away from talking about data and just looking at what happens in real life? And do we actually have to shift to what would an ideal world look like and actually modeling? Like, do we need to talk more about modeling and less about data? Oh, okay, big question there. So modelling, data, real life, how we want the world to be. Okay, uh, if you'd like to give the microphone to... Oh, you see, they're coming up with this. Okay, man with beard, and then person <coughs> hiding on the end there, and then I'll come back to the panel, and then I'll come out again. Hi, um, it's just... I'd, I'd be curious for some observations from the panel. So in a post-truth world, where our leaders make, make it up and decide what they want to believe in, 
How can data enable rebellion at grassroots level? Rebellion-driven data. Sorry, data-driven rebellion. Excellent, good. <laughs> See, there's a man with a beard for you. Uh, and there's, yeah, person hiding, uh, no, on this side. Yes, there you go, that little hand there. I'm, I'm not impugning the size of your hand, it's just you're appearing from behind somebody else. Um, yes, this is, um, uh, um, well, a, a <coughs> comment um, to the gentleman from the Royal um, Statistical Society. Um, I remember a lecturer in my um, first degree saying that there is no such thing as a fact, that everything is open to um, anybody's interpretation. Um, I would also like to um, take up a, 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 an issue with Dr. Is it Salt or Salt? Salt. Um, I don't know whether I misheard or, um, or, or something, but... Data is not information. You can have pages of tables of statistical um, data, um, but it only becomes information once it has been analyzed. And that depends on whether it's that an anal analysis has been objective and honest, which comes back to the issue of uh, bias in data. Um, when it comes to um, considering whether um, data is biased or not, um, you have to look at who has actually paid um, for that data to be collected. And if it's being collected in a biased way, i.e. if the survey or the questions in the survey have been um, 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 slanted in a particular way, um, you will get bias. And therefore, whatever everything else thereafter becomes biased. So the, the results in, in actual fact in themselves are biased. Thank you, excellent. Normally I discourage making two points at once, but your first one was very concise, so you've got away with it. Uh, okay, so panel, don't obviously, don't all feel you have to all answer everything because you saw how many hands there were, uh, but let me do a quick recap and then basically come back on whatever you feel like coming back on. So uh, there's a very, very big open question, how do we use data to make the world better? And a very specific one about the government ethnicity unit and what should they be measuring? Uh, there was the really huge question about things like criminal justice system data. Uh, is it completely impossible to mitigate bias? Possibly not, but should we instead stop looking at the real world and start building models, start thinking about how we want the world to be? I'm paraphrasing really badly. Um, sorry about that. Uh, how do we use data for rebellion? Typical man with a beard. Uh, and then comments about, well, come on, Karl Marx, 200 years. <laughs> Always trust a man with a beard if you want a rebellion. Uh, no such thing as a fact, and data is only information when it's interpreted, and then who's paid for the collection and the interpretation. So, who'd like to pitch in on what first? Come on, go on, Rob, go on. off you go. This is solidarity with men with a beard. Um, <laughs> I, so, uh, rebellion, um, but, but also to, to respond to the points about how we should use data and, uh, and the race disparity unit. Um, but I, it's always been really difficult to plot where policy decisions come from and, and where, the, where, the, where practice emerges from. Uh, so I'm just going to claim it. Uh, so this is a, it feels like the race disparity unit is doing some work, following on some, for some work that Runnymede started about a decade ago, thinking about how you, how you get citizens to use data to hold their uh, elected officials to account. Um, we base that on the piece of work which was done in, uh, in Chicago State, uh, where um, community organisers had given scores based on decisions that, uh, that congressmen had made um, and they would have members of their uh, constituency turn up and say, you've got a D this year, explain yourself. You've got an A this year, explain yourself. Because it was about uh, 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 using data to create a dialogue. Um, these free-floating, great website, where it goes next, is a, is, is a challenge. How, how, you, how you connect people to that data and connect uh, a dialogue and the politics back into uh, something which is perceived to be scientific and, 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 and distant, mm -hmm. um, to me, is, is, is key in both in starting rebellions, but also mm -hmm. uh, in working out how to use data. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Are you itching to get in as well? Go for yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take on the, the one about um, information. I think for me, part of the critical understanding of thinking about some of this is 
Um, if I'm looking at information, um, let's say an actuarial sheet of enslaved persons that somebody had owned, I'm actually looking at a societal moment where an individual has bought and sold someone um, and has maybe transported or taken on uh, pushing that, that property that they have to somebody else. So for me, that is information. Um, the same as if I'm looking at how many babies were born in the country at a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. The same as if I'm looking at um, the 2-2 uh, um, degree classifications for um, students who identify as African or African Caribbean. What you do with that is a whole separate set of uh, circumstances. But I think that the, the one point I'm trying to make about calling it information quite specifically, and this is not to, to, uh, to make some argument with, with Hatan, but I think we, we need to take a, a, for me, working on quite specific issues around racial equality, is I need to make sure that I'm look, making sure that data is, is structurally positioned and recognize that it's often talking about people. So one of the problematics that tends to happen, I find, is that people then neutralize the space and then it becomes just stuff where I really try to put back the politics back into that and go, this is actually information that is capturing a moment. Um, and it is not, it is, as Rob was saying, it is, it is very politicized. So that's probably my one question about not necessarily the fact part, but just the sort of softening that I think that you were taking about data. Because who gets counted as human, for the research I do, is quite significant. Where there are actual roles of data and information governments and empires have had where certain sets of people are not present there. So they weren't counted. That did not mean they did not exist as people, or that they weren't born, or that they did not die. It's that the data doesn't capture them as being human. And for me, that is so critical to have to reflect on that, to not put back into the space of data this whole sense of either neutrality or just this sense that you know it's it, even the quality aspect. I understand why we need to do it, but we have to think, because these histories are still alive. I mean, they have currency. You wouldn't have something like Windrush as a scandal right now um, actually erupting if these things weren't still present. It's not just that we're talking about 100 or 200 years ago or colonies or places far afield. It actually has a present right now. And then when people destroy records, ha ha, this is now having an issue around data because you have to evidence that you are actually in existence and be known. So suddenly now, the data has to take on an even more significant role to make you present in a space that is actually denying your presence, right? So this is the, these are the ways that I'm trying to understand this issue about information and really, I think, wrestle with it um, and, 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 um, and really understand that whether or not it's about the analysis part, the assembly part, or just the, you know, the gathering part. This is the great paradox of data, isn't it? That on the one hand, it has this, uh, this uh, as Rob said, this kind of scientific aura that makes it seem kind of superhuman and unbiased and unchallengeable. Uh, and yet, and, and that in fact, we do need it in order for evidence to make arguments. Absolutely. And yet it also has that distancing thing that makes it hard for us to feel that we can control it. Yeah, use and, it. And, I, and I should say, I work in data. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a researcher, um, and I, I, mean, I do consultancy in the advocacy and the social justice community work, but I'm not anti-information. I'm just having to constantly be grappling with it um, and actually and recognize my positionality. And I think the trust I have to have to work in that space and do it in a way that my ethics maintains itself as I'm interacting in that space and also imagining policies for the future. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm gonna tackle the question that some, yeah, one of the first ones to say, like, what should we actually do with the data? What, what's like, what's the end goal here? <clears throat> and I'm very much on offense on that. Um, so I think most people, or a lot of people would say that if we have really good data, unbiased data, that could help us to make better decisions, right? Like decision making. Um, let's get rid of that human factor that is so awful that makes those, all those awful decisions. And people say, well, quite rightly, um, well, algorithms are better than human decision makers because they're, you know, you cannot bribe them, right? Um, you, they're more consistent in what they do, right? They don't, they're not moody, right? They're very consistent. Um, <laughs> humans tend to be moody. Um, they're also faster, more efficient, right? So there is a lot of promise there to, to use algorithms for certain kind of decision making. But the very, very important question is, what does a good decision actually look like, right? And again, that's not a tech problem. 
And I think we need to have a very honest discussion about that. Because at the moment it says, yeah, we have just that kind of data. We run an algorithm for it, and it's going to make the best decision possible. Actually, how machine learning works is it learns from the past and predicts the future. Mm -hmm. And that's only correct. You only make good future decisions if the future stays the past, right? Um, this is I'd only jump a in on well finish, but <laughs> I want to come back on algorithms and Moody because I think they can be. <laughs> Wait till Sam's finished. So the idea is like even though this is a very powerful tool, we have to be very conscious of the limitations of machine learning in general because it only works if if, if the past looks, looks like, like the past. past, which is not a very good thing, right? So um, I think we have to be very conscious to think about the, where the opportunities and where the actual risks are. And there are certain areas where I would be very cautious to use algorithm decision making, and criminal justice is definitely one of them, um, for algorithmic sentencing, which is already mentioned, also predictive policing, right? Um, not the least because even if algorithms are more consistent, they are also very opaque and very hard to understand. Mm -hmm. And in those kinds of situations, you want to know why an algorithm assigned a certain risk score to somebody. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of tension to break up that black box. And usually it's two arguments, right? It's either I don't, I cannot tell you why the algorithm did that because the technology is so complex and um, I just don't understand. And or the argument, argument is, I don't want to tell you because it's trade secrets and intellectual property rights. And I think though, both those answers are not good enough mm -hmm. if algorithms are ma making very important decisions about us. So we have to be very conscious about what, where we deploy it, where it's helpful, and think about the limitations as well. Mm -hmm. So tell us about Moody algorithms. Yeah, uh, you, want, you wanted an argument, didn't you, on this? So here's <laughs> a stage in argument. But algorithms can be Moody. Uh, so here's an example where... Uh, uh, Lufthansa uh, became the dominant airline uh, in its country and so the algorithm was setting the price uh, and it suddenly realised that it could start increasing the price really quite ridiculously and so the price of the seats kind of went totally sky high and the regulator had to step in and sort of said to Lufthansa, what are you doing? You're behaving like a dominant uh, company and they said, well, it wasn't us, it was our algorithm, you know, the moody teenager in the corner. Sort of, so, I mean, it plays to your point that... If circumstances change, it can behave differently. But uh, in that sense, they're not always consistent. They can behave slightly erratically. I'd also, I suppose, position... Uh, I'd query the question of actually uh, transparency. The, the question is, what are we comparing the algorithm to? Uh, and often it's a human decision-maker who is also not very transparent. So, uh, I mean, I think one of the really exciting things about this conversation is that it's getting us to focus back on issues we should all, always ask about, which is how, how do we make human decision-making more transparent? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, are judges more lenient after lunch? Uh, there are some data which suggest that. I mean, it's been disputed, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, in a way, algorithms are biased, but humans are biased. And I think that's actually helpful. This, uh, this has sort of blown open a kind of conversation about bias and inequality in humans, mm -hmm. which I think has been quite helpful. Just to come back on some of the questions, if it's I okay. I can't jump up on that one, because you did this with me, I'm going to do it. Well, am I, can I answer the questions okay, first? OK, you ask the question first, and then you jump back. Yeah, yeah. And you will get a chance, Catherine, eventually. Uh, so <laughs> what, what can we do about the post-truth? How can we be rebellious in a post-truth world? Uh, I mean, it's hard, but I think... I, I would say one of the things is invest in good quality information. So, you know, I, I took out... Uh, a subscription to the New York Times. Uh, I don't really read it, but it's an act of rebellion in, for me in the States, right? So, solidarity, uh, just for good quality. Because journalism is basically dying. Uh, and so uh, you, could, you can uh, crowdfund fact checkers. Uh, I, I'm not saying these things are perfect. These things are not kind of upturning the information system, but they are a kind of important bedrock, as it were. So uh, I think that's important. And the final thing was just, uh, you know, no such thing as a fact. I mean, I, I disagree. Uh, I, I think that's the dangerous territory where you say everything can be discussed and open up. Well, at some level, yes, but that doesn't mean that it's all unbelievable. And I think that's, that's where we're in the trouble, where everything's post-truth, we can't trust anything, everything goes. And I just think that's a dangerous way to go. What did you want to come back um, to? Just this is all something that I, that I always hear um, when algorithms are making decisions. People say, well, you know, um, you don't understand how humans make decisions either, so why do you expect that from an algorithm? And I always say, I don't think human decision-making is the gold standard we should orient ourselves with, right? So 
actually, if anything, I hope that we're developing technologies to be better than where we are right now and that we're thriving towards something better. And it's like, oh, no, the algorithm is just as bad as a human, so it's fine. I'm not um, saying it's fine, but I think you do need to have a benchmark of what, you're, what standard you're holding it to. And there's a sense in which, at the moment, people are criticizing algorithms as they're not 100% fair. And of course, as we know, fair could be any lens. And nothing can be 100% fair across every lens, as it were. So that's politics, again. Yeah, but actually it could exacerbate like inequality because all of a sudden you have certain algorithms being you know developed by a couple of um, companies and that's just you know scale up the inequality whereas if you have just one human decision maker in a certain area you know you can minimize the damage so it's just scaling up in a way so it's not just saying oh it's not as good as humans it might be even worse okay scaling up bias that's a new interesting idea Catherine um, I think this is all very useful, but I think the one thing that our conversation isn't really doing is taking into account where we are now in terms of um, economic, global, technological development. So, you know, to the, to the point about, um, you know, how we, how we use data, it's also about how data uses us. It's about the fact that we're seeing power, everything we're talking about is about power imbalances that are in the analog world and ref refract into the digital world. And where we're also seeing, you know, I said at the beginning, I think it's incredibly important to engage with these things. I think it's incredibly important that we are having these discussions, but we're also already very far along in terms of the way in which the world is changing, in terms of the fact that every single one of you has created a data trail just by being here and the way that data is being collected and used also then continues to impact the way the world develops going forward. Um, on the small point, um, or, or not so small point about modelling, um, I mean, I, I think modelling would be, I think modelling is um, susceptible to all the same things that, that other uses of data are, but I also think it's impossible to get to the future you want to get to without in some way modelling it, without, you know, that's also what politics is. Politics is about articulating where you want to be and then showing how you get there. Um, data is about understanding what the mechanisms are that are stopping you from getting there and finding ways to dismantle them and, and reconfigure. Um, so, so that to me is is you know, what we need to be doing. But also, I mean, Hitan said very early on something about how we might think about owning data and holding data and whatever. And he talked about having this, this sort of public at arm's length entity. But, you know, you know what's going on in China where basically all data belongs to the government. And so these models are also part of the societies that they're in. And when I say we need to engage with this, I very urgently think we need to engage with this on every single level possible, because the country that we're in, the political system that we're in, will also uh, determine, you know, sometimes these things are global. Sometimes you have something like GDPR come along and you get 7,000 emails you didn't want. <laughs> um, but, but that you know, that's an attempt at, at something that isn't based in one country. But whatever happens, the society we're in will determine how our data is used and how our data uses us. And that's why I would entirely agree with, you know, the notion that we have to engage with these things very directly um, through politics, through advocacy, through understanding, through knowing what's going on. Um, you know, and, and again, that's where, you know, the data, data in the form of, of these, the, the writing that's being done on this subject, it's incredibly important. Excellent. On that note, back out to the audience. Look at all these hands. So please keep your contributions concise. I will try and get through everybody. Let's start at the front this time. We've got a hand, uh, just, just trying to keep you fit, you guys, the microphones. Hand right here on the second row and one on the front row, and then we'll work our way backwards. Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah, just building on Catherine's point about uh, the global nature of this market. Um, I'm, m my question, I suppose, is how do we balance the uh, demand for growth and ethics, uh, and in that, our desire for equality? And I had to take a very sharp intake of breath this morning as somebody on a panel uh, suggested that our libertarian um, idol is constraining our growth 
whilst China, as Catherine points out, who's using social scoring to try to balance the uh, books across society, have set a 10-year strategy to be dominant in, um, in, in a digital world and have a completely different social and, and cultural structure within which that, that digital design fits. So they are going to dominate. If we're, if we're not careful, their technology will dominate our world and we are constrained, as this chap who was saying this morning, by our liberal idols. Very good point. So are we in danger of holding back our development of these technologies by being concerned with ethics and then at risk of just getting overtaken by China who are not so constrained? Very good point. Uh, okay, off you go. And let's see more hands, then we'll get the microphone around. Uh, yeah, off you go. I, I've been interpreting the, the data, debates, data debates as people complaining about my work. Um, <laughs> people have been what is your work, sir? I, I'm a data scientist developer type <laughs> person and I write about technology. And people have been complaining about the stuff I've written for years and years and years. Um, I don't actually very often hear anything remotely constructive at all. And I've worked on projects which, when they one, one particular project uh, lost billions and billions of pounds, and people were sad about that, and I've done some databases for the government, and some people got sad about that. Um, and when I've seen projects go bad, I see basically what's on the um, platform in front of me. I see people complaining. I see powerful users, loud voices who want their system and they want it to do a certain thing. One project, data science project I was in, they wanted it written in Java. They didn't actually know what Java was, but Java was cool, so it had to be written in Java. And I hear these complaints, I hear very rarely do I hear anything which tells me as a developer what I should write and how I should write it. So do you know of any constructive ideas? If so, where do they come from? Because what I'm hearing currently is complaints. And the other thing that kills large <laughs> projects, because I've done government projects, is who is on the management committee? What I've heard, the other thing I've heard this evening is you lot want to be on the governing committee of the project. You want people like yourself. In commerce, it's called the business. We want business people on the um, committee of this large doomed project. In the civil service, it's referred to as the leadership team which probably tells you something very important about government versus commerce. Um, and they want to do it, and they want their voices, they want friends, they want business people like themselves, they want civil servants like themselves. What they don't want to actually do is do it, because I hear all these complaints and I very rarely hear them from people who could themselves actually write the code. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so you've got the microphone there, yeah, and I don't know if you can get your, yourself up to the... Oh, it's a hand up there, good, you go for that one. Yes, off you go. Uh, so most of you have mentioned that having more data is not a cure-all, but if some of the most expansive and extensive data sets being collected by the likes of Google or Facebook were made publicly available on the basis that it is our information, and perhaps their algorithms as well being released after, after a period of time, how helpful would it be for your work, and how beneficial for uh, society do you see it? There you are. I see. That was constructive. Uh, yes, thank you. So how, how could we use these uh, data sets and algorithms if they're available? So if you'd like to go to there, and meanwhile... Uh, oh, was there not someone at the back with a hand? Uh, oh, no, that was, that was somebody different. You keep putting your hands up, Dan. It's like whack-a-mole. Somebody put their hand up, quick. Good, there. Off you go. OK, so I, I wanted to speak as I'm an analyst in a team that is meant to provide evidence to inform decision-making. And... I just feel that, um, I think uh, the initial, uh, I can't remember who said it, sorry, um, but about critical analysis. Mm. And I think, as an analyst, I make a lot of decisions about how I'm going to analyze this data. And I feel it's really important that I document how I'm going about it, mm. so that someone can challenge me on that. Um, it's not always easy, so you can do that. You can write a nice methodological report, mm -hmm. and you can give your finding, and obviously, it's not very easy to give your short message of your finding, but all the caveats that go with it. But I think to the other um, data scientist uh, comment there, I feel actually 
it's incumbent on us as people doing the data science or the an analysis to be explicit about what we're doing and the consequences of that in relation to we're doing a piece of research or monitoring or evaluation and we're answering a question that someone asked us to answer. I think until the analysts own it and be clear about how they're doing it, then it's just a black box. Excellent point. That's a good point, not a question, yeah. actually. No, no, it's fine. No, no, we don't need... Points are fine, uh, but try and keep them concise and to the point. That was very good and very welcome. Thank you. Uh, so somebody here has the microphone, and then we go there, and then I will come back to the panel before they forget their own names. <laughs> Um, so I guess almost leading on from a couple of the comments already said, um, <coughs> so I guess firstly the idea that, you know, if we, if we go for ethics and everything, maybe we're restricting growth. So I think that's a very important point is that actually how do we convince people that ethics and, you know, equality is actually beneficial for society? Um, and then also on, that, uh, on, the, on the point that this lady just said there is... You know, if, if we have all of these tools for detecting bias, all of this data to make sure that we can have a more equal world, um, even with all of those tools and everything available for us to actually, you know, take it upon ourselves to make sure that we're not developing black box type algorithms, etc., I'm not 100% convinced that everyone would actually do that. I still feel like there's a lot of people in a lot of companies that if they don't have the proper incentive, i.e. money or even just the company in general, you know, they're looking at making profit and making their shareholders happy, and that does not always equal what is most beneficial for society. So I guess my question is more around, well, okay, given we have all these tools and everything, what are the incentives or how can we create those incentives? Okay, very good, an overarching question. Uh, so we'll go to that, that person there, and then we'll come back to the panel, but I will try and come back again and get everyone else in. Yeah? So actually it's interesting, because I was going to make... Um a comment um, mm -hmm. that, or mostly a provocative statement along the lines of what the gentleman uh, in front of me has said and the lady just beforehand, which is the fact that um, justice and diversity are not profitable. And I think, in a way, that's the big issue. Because if Facebook, Google, and all these big guys, they own most of the data, they, there's also this um, statistic that I might get wrong, so forgive me about this, but that the fact that um, I think most of the wealth is um, basically owned by 1% of the global population or something. These people have the data, these people have the skills, and they have absolutely no reason to give up on it because we wave the, uh, you know, the injustice flag and we tell them, oh, we want more justice. They, have the, they are the ones having the power. So, yeah, I think there's some, something that we need to do, incentivize those people who have the data, who have the knowledge, to actually do something in the, the right direction or in a more ethical direction. Thank you very much. OK, so, panel, it did wonderfully converging discussion here, including discussion between members of the audience, which I count as a sign of success, personally. Uh, so we've, we have the, this thorny question of, uh, are we in danger of holding growth back by ethics? And, uh, and some discussion provoked by that over here. The plea for some constructive suggestions instead of just moaning. Uh, uh, the, this question, if we've got all this data and the algorithms from the big companies, how could we use it to help? Uh, is ethics restricting growth? Do, do we need to convince people that ethics and equality are beneficial? If we do convince them, how do we incentivize people to actually be ethical? Uh, is the problem justice and diversity aren't profitable and it's a question of power? Uh, I think that would... Oh, and uh, is it incumbent on data analysts to be explicit about the decisions so that uh, we can go back and hold them to account? So lots of lots of clashing ideas here. OK, Peter, yeah. don't feel really you have to answer all of them, uh, obviously. I, no, 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 it's fine. But I got, kind of got one answer to the whole lot, in a way. So, <laughs> and then we can go to the okay. pub. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I suppose... Uh, what I hope is that we can use data ethics as a competitive advantage, right? So... Um, in a way, GDPR is a really good example of that. Uh, America, another place we're going, oh, this privacy stuff's really annoying. 
post Cambridge Analytica, suddenly they went, well, actually, we might ought to model some of ourselves ar uh, around that. So I, uh, and I think there's quite a lot of ethics work going on in the UK. There's a new Ada Lovelace Institute being set up, uh, which we've been part of. Uh, the government itself is setting up a centre for data ethics. There are new ethics codes. And this is my constructive advice, that there are some useful things. Because our community of statisticians <laughs> are saying, what do I do on Monday? Yeah, yeah. And that's what we're trying to help these organisations sort of build up to. So I think... Uh, there are some incentives for ethics. Uh, Google uh, staff recently said, we don't want to work on arms projects. We're an interesting space where uh, there's such a tight, skilled workforce that the workforce have power. Uh, and so actually, if we can help our data scientists think that this is something that they should care about, uh, they may be the route to some change. I'm not being naive here, but I'm always looking for where are the levers. Markets are less of a good lever. Facebook post Cambridge Analytica, their share price went straight back up. So, you know, uh, we as consumers are quite happy to keep plugging away on Facebook, it seems. So, but ultimately also, when the, other, when the ethics incentives fail, governments are still there and they're not powerless. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tom, um, just yeah. picking on you randomly. I very much agree with, with, with everything that you said. I think I'm going to start with the, the data richness thing and, like, if we actually need, you know, various kinds of sensitive data in order to make better decisions. And like I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I'm cautious about that data protection lawyer, in fact. So um, that's a very, I'm again, very much on the fence with that. I've been working with, with tech people a lot, and I've almost been converted. <laughs> um, because in data protection law, you usually say don't collect data that is sensitive unless, right? Data scientists tell me I need to know that information in order to be able to make the right decisions. So. Like, even if that's true, right, I think there is still a problem there that what, what you're actually asking of people is give me all the detailed, intimate information that you have, like everything that makes you vulnerable, and I'm going to protect you, <laughs> right? So tell me everything about your sexual preferences, tell me about your race, your religious beliefs, your political opinions, so I can make sure you're not discriminated against. Like, that's wow. Um, just to put it a bit more in a context, like, Facebook did this recently in a very funny way, but it, I think it's a very good example. I don't know if, if people remember that, but Facebook was trying to combat um, revenge porn on the internet. And what they suggested was, send me all your nude pictures. Once somebody posts something about you, we can take it down immediately. That was their suggestion, right? And that's ridiculous, but it's like, it's in the same realm. It's like, give me something that could potentially be hurtful, I'm gonna protect you. And even though I think it's very important to keep that in mind because probably we need some kind of crucial information, sensitive information to protect people, we need to think about a step further, who holds that data, you know, who protects that data, who gets access to that data, how is it being used? And then we can have this discussion around that because like just collecting sensitive information about everybody, that's a very dangerous territory. And historically speaking, as you mentioned, that's very much a problem. The other thing is, I think I take those two together. I'm very sympathetic. Um, because I used to be a lawyer that just worked with lawyers, and now I start working with tech people. And I get the frustration there that especially lawyers complain all the time and tell you, you can't do that, you can't do that, do it better, but don't come up with any sensible solutions. And this was actually something that I tried to get across in my initial thing. This is why you actually need to work with different disciplines together, right? So you can actually give people guidance, because I think the last thing that we need is yet another set of principles that don't give you any guidance, right? Be fair, be good, be ethical, be just. Well, okay, what, what, how do you do that, right? There is no consensus on those things, so we actually would need to break it down for specific applications, for specific sectors, and give guidance, say this is what you can do and this is what you can't do. But there you actually need you know, people from different disciplines working on this together and finding consensus on those things. And the last thing, I think, and that's also very important, um, Ethics as a hindrance, um, uh, or law as a hindrance, actually, and it's you know going to destroy the economy. I think that's a very dangerous discussion as well. Because if we do that, we're just going to have a race to the bottom. Basically, we're going to compete over you know stuff we shouldn't be competing about. And I think the more um, countries or nation state come together and say this is certain uses we're not going to do. We're not going to use data algorithms for that. Um, that's actually a step forward to making sure that we don't abuse those technologies. Um, but saying that ethics is a hindrance, I think that's very 
much more problematic. I very much agree with you that it's actually a competitive advantage because I'd rather go to a company that is ethical rather than somebody you know, who does devious stuff with it. And th there's the law, again, there is the law um, that can, when, if you don't want to rely on the ethical conscience of a company, then you have the law, and this is why we have regulation, and sometimes where we need regulation. We have, for example, anti-discrimination law. We don't just trust people to be not racist. We have laws that force them to do so. And sometimes we need to have a discussion about that too. Do we need laws that force you to do the right thing if you don't do it on your own? Ex can I? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with everything you said, and also the point, the, the Facebook example that you gave is such a perfect example of what happens when you have too few kinds of people in a room thinking about something. Because you damn well know that that was a decision made by white men in a room. I mean, you absolutely know that. And so to your point about complaints, I mean, um, I have to say, I think yours is the only complaint I've heard this evening. I think everyone else has been talking about big issues and how to approach them. And I, but I like the fact that you keep coming back to these debates, even though you think that we're all whinging. <laughs> but in terms of what, in terms of, I didn't think that this was a job interview and that we were all trying to get on the boards of these things. But I think this would actually look like the beginnings of a good board for exactly the reason that, that Sandra just <laughs> talked about. It, you need different perspectives, different disciplines. Yes, you need coders. Um, I'm, I actually, the other day, started to try and learn coding just so that, because I keep having these conversations about, you know, you don't know how to do it, okay, but I'm eventually going to know how to do it. I'll still be shit at it, but I'll know how to do it. <laughs> um, and, um, but the, the point about bringing, about how we get the good solutions to this is precisely to bring in these different perspectives. And yes, we have to come up with intensely practical solutions. And again, that's what I think these discussions are the beginning of. Uh, in terms of the question about big data sets, um, big data sets can be, they, they might be immensely useful, um, you know, in, in health uh, are some of the most obvious applications where big data sets might actually speed, you know, find, find ways to um, tackle diseases more efficiently, but also, you know, um, people looking for efficiencies in the healthcare system um, could be wonderful that way. But used wrongly, it could also end up making whole groups of people completely uninsurable. So it goes back to that point about, you know, it's not the data, it's how, it's how the data, in that case, it's how the data is used, as well as how secure the data is and all the personal details that we know can be reverse engineered sometimes when people say they're not. Mm. And can I add, yeah. I think those two conversations actually about the, the critical analysis and I think um, the, the, the data specialist or technician, because for me, um, I mean, I don't know how much you know about any of us in terms of the projects we might be on or the people we might be involved with, but I would, I would encourage you to be involved with Digital Catapult if you're not already, um, because that is a place where you are seeing not necessarily <clears throat> data digital specialists over here, but you're seeing SMEs, you're seeing um, companies who are driving an, a, an incredible amount of innovation. Um, you're seeing governmental bodies struggling to try to figure out what to do, both at the local authority level, um, who, are, who are making relationships with different sets of people because they don't necessarily have the specialists in-house, um, and then uh, have third-party providers holding on to what might be local authority information. So it's actually it's going to need all hands on deck, um, but I think more importantly, it's going to need everybody owning their positions coming in and actually trying to recognize this. This is not a you versus them, them versus us kind of a thing because my whole point about information and critical analysis is all of that plays a part, right? Every single part. It's not just that tech is therefore bad and evil and go out tech people and try to make tech better. It's the fact that it's, it's, it's serving a node in a whole place, right? And this is why I want to get us back to the fact that this is not a debate about technology. This is a debate about data and inequality. Right? So we need to focus on this question of inequalities and really try to grapple with what are we actually talking about that about there. Are we throwing data at it as a solution? I think Hatam brought that up very clearly. Are we actually trying to understand that it's social mobilization? It's all of you collectively coming together to try to come up with the decisions about that? Is it a combination of both? 
Do you need to go back and mobilize? And, and we haven't mentioned this tonight. We've talked quite freely about the technology, but we also have a significant amount of people who are digital by default, um, who may have very little access to, to, to tech devices or information who are not linked up, but their information is. And not only is their information li linked up, but their authority and power is now um, required to have a digital file. You can't now get a passport without certain sets of information. So we've kind of created certain kind of citizenship kind of processes that we're not just talking about kind of inequalities like, oh, you, have a, you don't have so much wealth and let's do this other thing with China. We actually have processes now that we can look around that, you know, all of you still know you can go to places and have no mobile connect connectivity, but you can also go to so loads of places and have no internet at all. <laughs> it's not just that your phone won't connect, you can't find a provider. So we've got to kind of think through that we've got a lot of sets of these inequalities that are there. And one of the biggest one is access to technology. Um, and, and not just think that it's that we just make the bigger ship over here and we can just drag everybody there. It's the fact that those things are not necessarily connected. Um, and there are lots of groups who are trying to work on this. But that means we've got to look at it from every direction possible if we're going to move up like the entire society um, uh, around inequalities. Otherwise, we're going to be fixing the problems for a very small set of people who live in certain boroughs in London, and we're not actually going to be going anyplace else to actually solve um, larger scale inequalities. We have, uh, well, technically no time left, but if, if you're OK with this, we are allowed to run on for a few minutes. I, I really would like to get anyone from the audience who had not got a chance to speak yet who wants to speak. Um, before I give the panel the last word. You see, you're immediate. Now I've said that, you're going, oh, we could go to the bar. <laughs> uh, OK, no, someone on the right in the back row wants to do that. This is your absolute last chance to have a word. So <coughs> stick your hand up now. Hi there. Um, one quick question. There's a bias in data that people don't often talk about, which is that human decision making is often not based in aggregate. It's big events. It's like really big stuff. And that, those events vanish in data if you take any lengthy time period. Like, there's only one tower block that burnt down recently. And there are good reasons to make decisions based upon that fact that have to do with race, to do with gender, to do with class. But if you look at a time series, that event will vanish. It will diminish at least. It will go away in the analysis. How, if we make more decisions based upon aggregate just data, that seems like a big changeover in the way we make decisions from these big events to this long-term aggregate event making. How do we balance that off? Mm. How do we make those decisions we would otherwise make by machines more like the decisions we would make like people, where that's useful, where it helps greater resilience in our society. How do we prevent the default mechanism of how data sees the world becoming the default way that we see the world and make decisions? Well, that's a, ah, don't, is that a hand? Is somebody like texted in a question or yeah. something? Yes, wow, can we have the, mic Sorry, have the microphone around here? You're gonna be really fit. You, I hope you've got your step counters on. <laughs> you might carry a people. Because steps don't count if they're not counted, you know that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so this is a question from Twitter, and it's quite a good one to end on. It's, um, does the panel feel the public have anything to add on the debate on data and inequality? And if so, how do you go about making the debate more inclusive? Does the panel think the public have anything to add? Bear in mind, this question has been tweeted in. Do we know who by? Is it anonymous? Someone from Nesta. Someone from Nesta? <laughs> oh, they don't count. They're not the public. Oh, They're just no. wants. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> <laughs> I should be quiet. I'm working for them in a few weeks. Uh, OK. Well, so, so panel, bear in mind, that I have to say, we're technically over time. Uh, and I have spared you another rank of six questions at a time. But we have that. How, you know, how can we get the public involved more? Uh, well, I mean, feel free to say, no, the public shouldn't be involved. I, I'd be surprised if any of you do after the discussion <laughs> we've had so far. Uh, and how do we prevent the way data sees the world becoming the default for how we see the world? Is that another question? Look. <laughs> Where's their microphones gone? <laughs> All right, this, this person over here. I did say it was your last chance, so OK. It's, it's got to be better than that one that Nesta tweeted in. <laughs> but as we know, Nesta aren't really the public, so they don't really care. <laughs> Sorry, it's a comment on your summing up, really, about involving the public, because a lot of the problems we have, certainly I'm responsible for some government data sets, are in getting the right people in the public mm -hmm. to engage with the questions in the first place, mm -hmm. which leads to some of the bias in the statistics, which means we don't know what people need. Mm -hmm. And it's a really hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the problems with data stem from the fact that it's really hard to get people to take part in the surveys to collect the data, which means we just don't know for mm -hmm. big, big sections about the population. Mm -hmm. And I work in food. 
our response rate is usually 50% just, which means half of the people out there, we don't know about their choices around food. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, well, it's excellent then. So that's kind of tied in uh, the question to end on. So, panel, uh, be, be concise, be pithy, be whatever you want to be, but uh, this is your kind of last word. So shall I, shall I take you in the same order that you started off in and just give us your your final pithy thoughts to send us into the bar? Um, yeah, I think the, the engaging the public question is, is very, very important and also something is very close to my heart because I, I go to a lot of those events and panels and very often you don't see a representative of the general public in a sense. It's hardly ever that civil society is there. It's even less that like actually, I don't know, somebody from a union or consumer protection is there. Um, and those would be the people who actually know what's happening on the ground, right? We talk about inequality in employment, for example. Maybe you should talk about the people in the union, right? Um, we talk about the fact that you know the um, algorithms are being used for certain products that we're not happy with. Maybe talk to the people who buy that actual stuff. So consumer protection groups would be an actually good start to have a discussion. If you have actual problems, and I get that, but I work with social scientists as well, and they all have problems with getting good data by our surveys or interviews and focus groups. I get that. Um, but you could start with at least representatives groups. And I think it's very, very crucial to, ge to get those people in because we all talk about good decision making and AI being used for the good, but you don't ask the people. Um, so it's just you know, an elitist community that decides what's good for society, but I should actually should ask the public about that. Thank you very much. Catherine. <laughs> Um, to the point about the, the aggregate decision making, um, I think that's just a really good illustration of why there always has to be a role for human intervention, for um, uh, the ability for, for human, the right human intervention, which goes back to the question of what that looks like and how we get to that point. Um, and, and that actually also links through to this question about um, public involvement with this you know through advocacy through politics i talked about education these are things that we should be learning about and discussing and understanding you know you can't have for example something as as small as as the the dreaded cookie consent part of the reason that was such a nonsense is because nobody ever looked at it or knew what it meant if they did look at it um, you know we talk about as somebody talked about about in you know knowledge knowledge-based decision-making is the basis of democracy. It's the basis of everything, but you can't have it without giving people the tools for that. So there are some organizations as, for example, <laughs> indeed, I believe Nesta is somewhat involved in this and Dot Everyone. And, you know, there are lots of people who are trying to find ways to get uh, the general public, which by the way is a phrase I hate because there is no such thing as the general public and we are all the public as well as being involved in you know, and that distancing of, oh, the public over there, that's something you always hear people in government doing, the public, you know, that's us. Um, and that's why I meant we all have to engage with it. We all have to find whatever ways we can to understand it and to spread that understanding and to get people to understand that unless you engage with this stuff, it is going to roll right over us. Thank you. So I can, I think I can talk to all three. Um, uh, to the comment about uh, responsiveness, um, you know, uh, I would probably counter that with, that's probably not the case for every situation. There are, there are plenty of reactionary types of um, policy making um, that tends to come really quickly uh, for set, certain sets of people and certain sets of incidences and other certain sets of people where it drags out and you have 57 inquiries, you have to have a talk and you have to have a thing, and you have to consult before finally people might actually go, we're horrible. Right, and we should change, right? And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I mean, I, I appreciate your point about data and aggregation, but I would, I would take us right back to the inequalities thing and actually kind of go press at that to recognize when does, when does the letters and the evidence making that that community had done for a very long time not get taken up as data and evidence, right? 
Um, and now we have this inquiry where this conversation is happening um, to a certain extent. But that is not the first time anybody had heard about the, the right cladding. So I think we've got, we've, got, we've got to really press that inequalities to really, I think, kind of understand how do we handle and deal with that set of data, um, which goes back to you know, the race um, disparity audit information. And I think the previous conversation from before, because that's, that's great as a set of information that's been aggregated from information that's already been gathered. Um, but that doesn't necessarily move us further to trying to actualize and use that information and then actually hold particular sets of departments accountable. That's supposedly going to happen, but right now it's not. Um, and that would be great to turn back to people to actually then try to put, in, and, and various groups are doing this. Some groups are doing around data transparency and openness. Some are mobilizing around a kind of citizen assembly kind of approach to try to um, you know, uh, deal with issues around privacy. But you can see what we've been talking about today, that all the different levels that this might be involved in criminal justice, education, healthcare. It's, it's not going to be just enough that I give you access to my information that's on my phone, that's on my Facebook. We have a whole set of things that are happening without anybody's kind of knowledge or consent, whether or not we're talking about facial recognition in parks to try to um, keep certain sets of people out of them, all the way through to other sets of things that are done for the public good. Uh, that don't necessarily need to necessarily get your permission to be a part of that because it's imagined for the public good. And that is also perpetuating a whole raft of issues around the power that different sets of people can actualize around a moment. And that gets right back to this question about inequalities because that means certain sets of people's voices are OK to come in certain sets of arenas, and others just disappear. Right? They're kind of in the noise. And this gets to the question about reaching people. There, it may not be an accident that certain sets of people do not want to engage with certain sets of people in authority and power. And we have to reckon with that to what does that mean when people are not disengaged. They are choosing to not engage with you. Right? Um, and at this hard to reach population rhetoric it needs to get kind of thrown on top of its head and really actually go, are we doing anything that makes anybody trust us, um, trust what we've ever offered of anything, of any kind, of it, for anybody? It could be the university going into spaces, much less an activist group. Um, because what's being sold, empowerment, uh, rainbows, unicorns, touch my thing, my data, my stuff, and you'll, everything will happen, and then you, you don't give it. It doesn't happen. People's lives continue. That has, a, that has an effect, right? And I think that's where there's some work to think about the fraying of these sets of relationships over time, and not just about I really wish. I mean, I appreciate the point, but I, I really wish I could get the people. If I just had the people, I'd get the information, because lots of people talk about that. And I'm like, maybe you need to reckon with the fact that you will never get them if you currently have the, the sort of structures you've got in place, right? They're at home with the curtains drawn eating pies. They don't want to see. <laughs> <laughs> Follow that, Rob. Oh, funny, what, what pies? <laughs> now I've got, uh, anyway, um, uh, look, in 1971, uh, Bernard Cord published uh, how, the, how the West Indian child is made educationally subnormal in the English education system. Uh, in the early 80s, we saw uh, the Sus laws lead to riots in, mm. in Brixton and Tottenham. Uh, we knew um, about patterns of uh, labour market exclusion. We knew about uh, poorer health, health outcomes. We knew about uh, the racist treatment of people at borders. And we knew about the grandkids of, the, of, of that generation who Bernard Cord uh, identified as being uh, taken out of education. Uh, two thirds of them are on a gang's matrix held by the Metropolitan Police. Um, it's not a major surprise people don't want to fill in a form. It's not a major surprise that in that context, for many people, uh, the, 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 the particular tragedy of, of that Windrush moment was people were asked for papers after that set of experiences that had built up over, over, over a set of generations. Um, I, I, I suppose I would just make the plea that we don't, we don't forget that we're talking about people mm -hmm. and we're talking about data. Uh, we're talk, particularly talking about ethnic data, we're talking about people's experience. Um, I'm currently in the throes of, of, of setting up uh, this new organisation, Blackout, which works, works with black gay men. We don't feature in any of the census data. There's, there's no cross-referencing, so we can't find out that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm convinced that, as a community, we didn't own anything. Uh, there's not a physical building, there's not a, there's not a infrastructure, there's not a business infrastructure, etc. We didn't own anything. But what we might own is our data now. So there might be a way in which we can uh, use 
the, the collection of that data shared with each other to start to build a community asset that might actually have some impact back on our, back on our community. And that's, that's why I think this discussion isn't lost. Um, this isn't just about complaining about what, uh, what's gone before, but it's about thinking uh, about a, a new uh, access to power and, and, a, and a way of shifting power that we might be able to achieve through uh, that ownership uh, and control of data. Thank you, Will. Newton. Uh, I mean, the thing that's really come out, hasn't it, is uh, data operates within power structures, as it were. Uh, if you think about the word statistics, it came from the word state because it was the numbers that the state wanted from you. So even the genesis of the term is bound up in power structures, as it were. And I think today has been a bit about uncovering some of those, as it were. So the point is, if you want to create change, data is a tool, uh, and we need to harness that. Uh, but it's not the only thing. Data is necessary for creation of change, but certainly not sufficient. And I think the points made about the importance of civil society and movements is really, really critical. And one interesting theme that uh, I mean, Rob just touched on right at the end there was owning our data. Mm -hmm. And this is quite a seductive movement at the moment. Sort of the way forward is if we all owned our data, we'd have rights and power over it, as it were. Uh, and I'm quite worried about that way of framing it because it's very individualistic. Uh, those who are poorest, uh, if they own their data, can then trade it away. Whereas I, who am more well off, can say, actually, I don't want to trade my data. I'll pay for an email service where I pay 20 quid a year or something, and I don't have to give G Gmail my data, as it were. So I'd much prefer to see a discourse based on data rights than data ownership. Thank you all for coming. Uh, there is, as we heard, uh, another event on the 14th of September in this series. Please come back and be annoyed again. We valued your contribution. We won't ask you to code anything in Java, we promise. Uh, uh, thank you to all the crew that are putting this on, uh, to the British Library, to the Turing Centre, and especially thank you to this fantastic panel. Thank you. Thank you.